Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, look at that. What, what an energetic crowd. That's fantastic. Um, thank you all very much for joining, and uh, welcome to uh, Tianjin. Welcome to the World Economic Forum's uh, 12th uh, annual meeting of new champions. It's a great delight to, to have you here. Um, I am uh, not Michael Jacobides. <laughs> My name is Derek O'Halloran. I'm with the World Economic Forum. Um, I head up our digital industries and digital uh, agenda. Um, Michael um, has been um, is has been experiencing some Chinese traffic, uh, and is currently being ushered through security. So he will be here any minute now, along with uh, our colleague Leanne Kemp. Um, but perhaps I can um, just get things started um, with with our colleagues that we do have here, um, and maybe we'll just quickly run down the line and ask everyone to, to introduce themselves, uh, and uh, then we'll be able to get the, uh, the conversation started. So um, perhaps uh, Stan or Sebastian, yeah. apologies, why don't we start with yourself? Yeah, so my name is Sebastian Winnifsky. I'm the chief technology strategist for Standard Charter Bank. So Standard Charter Bank is operating in about roughly about 60 countries and uh, also in China, and we are roughly about 80,000 employees. Uh, Andrew Vaz, I'm the Global Chief Innovation Officer for Deloitte um, across all of our businesses and the role involves two dimensions. One is the transformation of Deloitte in the context of digital enterprise and two also helping our clients across all industries with the digital strategies and ecosystem and platform strategies. And I'm, I'm Dick Daniels, I'm the Chief Information Officer for Kaiser Permanente. Uh, we're in the U.S. We have about 39 hospitals, uh, 680 clinics, and we serve about 12.8 million members of Kaiser Permanente in the area of healthcare. Great, thank you. Um, so maybe just to, uh, to uh, frame the discussion here. Um, so future is platforms uh, is 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 the the topic at hand. Um, the just maybe to give a little bit of context to that, the, the World Economic Forum over the past uh, three years or so has worked with 14 different industry sectors uh, to map out what is a 10-year picture of what that industry transformation will look like as a result of digital transformation. Uh, as part of that, it identified significant uh, new pools of value um, and it also identified some key risks. And as we identified the new pools of value, and we started to categorize and classify the, the, the types of business models that would deliver those, those, that value. Around about 70% of the, the value, new value created, um, was based upon data-driven uh, platforms. In many cases, multi-company, in many cases, multi-industry uh, platforms. And that, that equates to around about $60 trillion uh, dollars of potential value to be added. Um, I think the, the topic of platforms is something that we're seeing around pretty much every uh, industry, every sector, although as we were discussing uh, just before we started, what we mean by platforms is often, people often have a very different picture in their heads. Um, and how we go about uh, delivering on a platform, you know, just the simple fact that not every organization can be a platform, there have to be things on the platforms. Um, and uh, and then there's a range of um, policy and societal questions that also get thrown up, whether it's around <laughs> antitrust, whether it's around um, monopolies or, or, or others. And in fact, we see many different types of um, uh, issues being thrown up on different types of platforms, whether it's B2B or B2C and, 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 and others. So there's a, it, it's, this is a, a topic where it, it's clearly front and center of mind to a lot of uh, the future strategies of a lot of organizations, but it's highly amb uh, ambiguous as to what that looks like. Uh, it's a very fragmented, um, perhaps conceptual discussion right now, uh, but there are, near, there are real immediate near-term pressures, commercial and, and otherwise, to, to, to start developing strategies and executing. So, so maybe we could just uh, lead off, and, and I'd love to hear from, from each of you how you think about, within the context of your organizations, how you think about platforms, how they fit into the overall strategy <clears throat> direction 
the organization uh, and you know how you would uh, sort of approach some of these these questions that I, I laid out uh, and maybe just before um, just be well perhaps why don't we let Leanne catch a breath so why don't we start at, at, uh, at this end and then Leanne, when we come to yourself you might be able to introduce yourself uh, uh, as well um, so, well, why don't we just uh, start here with, uh, with yourself, Sebastian? Yeah, maybe to give a perspective and also why we are speaking here. You know, from banking, as I said, you know, Standard Charter is now oper since 160 years old. Yes, so it's uh, quite old. And when we're looking at all the history, let me say it like this, uh, it was all physically banking, yes, people-led and all of this, while we still in many countries are still there. But for example, if you go to Africa and so on, there's not any more like a branch relevant and so on, yes. So it's um, really now where we shift from, from being physically to think about banking and to uh, go to banking, moved where we are today is more like the mobile app, yes. So, but um, the mobile app is still not the platform, to make it very clear, yes? So this is where we are still today. And um, the key question is, do you need banks for banking? So this is where we are turning on to, to, to platform discussions, where we are saying, okay, today we are still be, you know, in a digital world now where we not need physical presence, but we still need to think digital, digitally about banking and the banks that I have to open now Standard Charter app and so on. So where's the future about this and how we are thinking there is really about in a decentralized model where we are operating in 62 countries to be precise, B2B as well as B2C. So it's not just retail. Retail is about 35 countries. Um, and then the world is not the mobile app. Yes? So the, the question will be now uh, driven in banking by open APIs, so open banking APIs, driven by you know, thinking that we can't deliver one unique value proposition to meet customer needs from end to end. So this is a point about how we are uh, bringing different services even from other you know, uh, institutions together and creates a value proposition there. So, and this is exactly where we are thinking in, in a sense of banking. Just imagine about supply chain management. So this is more the traditional B2B. This is changing dramatically. So the financing is changing dramatically. Just this is 3D printer, so you don't need now physical asset to transport. So this is also the way how we have to think, how we have to link, how we have to connect to all of the services. So at the end, the banks are disappearing with the platform, <coughs> but the banking not. And this is exactly the point how we keep still the brand identity uh, going forward. But on the other side, with all the connectivity across all these different businesses, to be there present, but <coughs> to be not visible. That's great. I, I love that, um, you know, do you need banks to do banking? Uh, so I think that gets to the heart of the existential question that actually probably you feel across multiple sectors. You can apply that in lots of different ways. Okay, um, Andrew, just before we come to yourself, um, so our, our moderator has uh, survived the <laughs> Chinese traffic and is here. So maybe I'll ask the, the real Michael Jacobides. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that shows you that the digital world can only take you so far. And there are physical realities that you can ignore at your peril. I do apologize for not quite being aware of the intensity of the physical realities. Uh, and it's great to have now all of the panel and, you know, uh, Jan and I were uh, quite running under the same constraints that we were both uh, faced with. Um, what, what I'd like to do is to sort of take us a step back a little bit. And um, I guess that what I had, uh, uh, we had discussed with the panelists to give a bit of an introduction in terms of the framing. Uh, because when we think about digital platforms and ecosystems, there is a lot of excitement. And if you uh, think about the fact that in the chief strategy meetings in the WEF, that came as the third most important thing, unsolicited, it really means that you have something interesting and something unusual there. And in my discussions um, with uh, executives, I see that this is becoming both with senior executive teams, but also with boards of directors more recently, something that is a real issue of concern. Obviously, everyone is aware of the fact that the top firms in the planet in terms of market capitalization, whether you go to uh, uh, the usual GAFA or whether you think about Alibaba and Tencent, um, are firms that are based on platforms and build their own ecosystems. But the real question is why and what does that mean? I think that what we are seeing now is a shift 
not only to the firms that are using the platforms in order to orchestrate sets of complementers, but we should see that the entire economy is starting to change traditional structures, exactly what you were speaking a moment ago, like with banking that is being transformed, uh, and like with a number of other sectors that are being transformed. The World Economic Forum, and we're working with it, with Derek Steam and Christian and others, and uh, with a team from Deloitte, um, uh, trying to map part of these winds of change and trying to see what is the nature of this transformation. But it may be worth giving just a couple of points for us to consider. People looking at platforms have been excited just for developing their own platform. On the other hand, just investing in a platform does not necessarily mean that you will be able to succeed. If we believe, for instance, that platforms are these places with network externalities where it is easy for people to go because they know the one place that they all gather, it means that there are going to be fewer of them around and we see an increase in concentration as well as an increase in the expectation of what individuals face. Now, for consumers, this can be terrific because what you see as digital transformation and as the creation of platforms and ecosystems essentially means that we're starting to not take uh, the world for granted. We don't use the existing definitions of sectors, but we are asking <coughs> what customers want to see and what are the products that fulfill the needs. To go back uh, to uh, the point that was just made here, but Stephen, uh, banking as we know it is no longer necessarily relevant. Financial intermediation in some shape or form will continue being relevant. But what we see with the growth of these platforms is a greater customer centricity on the one hand. We care about what customers want and a number of these uh, platforms that are created that help individuals with their needs focus on the needs of the customers. At the same time, with these platforms, we see some firms that manage to organize them. If you think about Xiaomi, it is, uh, for those that are not from China, it isn't only a company that creates a phone that can rival iPhone. It is a company that can connect all the devices that you have at your home in order to give you the peace of mind and the ability of managing all of these devices that changes the value proposition for the customer and that is able to take all of these developments, these technologically developed developments that create these platforms in order to deliver new value. That, though, also creates a number of new challenges. When you, as a company, need to think about how you're going to be adding value, you need to not only rethink, what does a customer really want? You also have to say, and how can I connect with other participants, other firms that can be combined, linked to my own ecosystem, so that together we can give some value. Ecosystems then, digitally enabled ecosystems, allow us to provide and cover new needs, but also allow us to find new ways of, of connecting firms. So what I'd like to do as we go around in terms of uh, this panel is to facilitate the conversation and understand where do we see these changes and what are the main issues. We'll speak a little bit about strategy, a little bit about organization, a little bit about implementation. Uh, but what I'd like to do is um, start with Andrew. And given Andrew's role uh, as someone who is responsible to thinking about innovation in the context of Deloitte and as such interfacing with a big number of different clients uh, who are facing these problems. Andrew, let me just ask you, what are the sectors, what are the areas where you see more activity, more excitement in terms of uh, the growth of platforms and ecosystems since this is the topic of today's panel? Michael, thank you. Um, <clears throat> you talked about customer centricity, and I think that is the key in thinking about ecosystems and platforms. Everything we do now, whether it's a Deloitte strategy, it's a strategy for our clients, it is really what is the differentiating point for what the customer is looking for. When we think about ecosystems and platforms, we always place it in the context of digital transformation. And, and there are many frameworks and definitions, et cetera. But ecosystems and platforms are two critical levers within digital transformation. And if you are not playing in those two, you are not 
being digital in your company or aspiring to be digital if you're not digital native already. As I think about the landscape around moving to digital, there's probably four major ecosystems, if you will, that I would describe. The first one, and it's really where there's some really excitement going on, this is what I would call macro ecosystems. This is the area where you transcend industries and sectors as we know them today. And you have things like the future of mobility or smart cities or the future of health and wellness where you see healthcare and banking and wealth management coming together. This is truly where we're seeing new transformative thinking coming out from multiple players across all sectors. And I know Dick, you know, you're, you're involved in a lot of things as part of Kaiser as well. Um, so here, just an example, the Ford, you know, Ford Motor Company has got something called the Transportation Mobility Cloud, uh, open source platform. Uh, it, they have developers, they have transportation companies, they have service delivery providers, and their vision is to become the platform where many people can come in and they can address many use cases, whether it's transportation as a service or it's fleet management or it's autonomous vehicles. So just, that's just one example of kind of in the mobility space, if you will. The second one is what we call micro ecosystems. And you see many of these in the marketplace today. Some of them are the digital giants as we know them. So these are the advertising, the e-commerce ecosystems, you know, those types of things. Um, a good example of, you know, just one company here is Baidu's you know, Apollo project, which is 100 plus partners coming together to create a driving platform. Uh, in banking, uh, I'm sure you know about the Hyperledger project with blockchain. You know, that's around payments and other use cases. So that's a micro ecosystem. But also, we're seeing lots of exciting activity in what I would call the learning and experimentation ecosystems. These are either technology domain specific, like AI or blockchain, et cetera, <clears throat> where you see startups and researchers, funders and VCs, et cetera, coming together to accelerate innovation and experimentation. So you see the plug and plays or the Y Combinators in Silicon Valley, you see uh, Singularity University, you see MIT Labs, and pockets of, of great uh, experimentation going on across the globe. And then lastly, I would say that you would see the, something we call societal ecosystems are starting to emerge, where now you have big societal issues, whether it's, it's the imperative of the news, the integrity of news today, or whether it's the future of AI in our society, we're starting to see lots of organizations come together to try and address those. But what's also interesting, Michael, is even within the current giants, you're seeing very interesting things happen. You're seeing combinations of activities. So you have Walmart and Microsoft coming together in partnerships to take on their shared rival, Amazon. But then you have Microsoft and Amazon coming together to integrate Cortana and Alexa. You have Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Twitter coming together around a data sharing project. So these are fundamental alignment of incentives to get the platforms even more powerful. And then finally, we sit here in, 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 in a country where we have two of the most eminent ecosystems, Tencent Alibaba as an example. I don't know how many of you got the latest HBR article this month where Alibaba was featured. You should pick it up, it's a great read. And Meng Zhang was uh, from Alibaba coined the term smart business. And what he's talking about, there's four major characteristics. These are the, this is the essence of what makes a powerful ecosystem. First, you datafy every single customer interaction. Second, you software every activity in your organization. Third, you get the data flowing fast, APIs and incentives amongst, amongst your ecosystem partners. And then lastly, you get algorithms applied through AI. Alibaba is, is preeminent at this, so is Amazon, but you also see Amazon moving in, into various other sectors like healthcare. Now with uh, their venture with uh, Berkshire Hathaway and JP Morgan Chase, going after cost control in healthcare. So those are some of the interesting things that, ha that are happening in the landscape. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that you mentioned in terms of the ecosystems and the common thread in terms of all of these levels from the micro to the micro is that we have a number of different organizations that need to uh, work together to collaborate and compete in order to give a final uh, good or service to the customer. Uh, and 
perhaps what's worth considering is why ecosystems have come to cover that uh, need now. If you think about it more broadly, we used to have standards. But what happens in this world is that we need something that is more responsive than standards, and we have these things emerging. And you also have firms that create their own ways of combining stuff. So think about hot water, tea, and tea leaves. Sure, we need to put them together in order to make tea. But think about Nespresso. You have a specific coffee with a specific capsule, which can then create an ecosystem of the complementers that create the machines. And then you can start thinking about the strategic ecosystems that are sort of the Nespresso one versus Senseo and versus others. So we'll want to push a little bit more, but before I return to you, because I'd love to know how firms strategically are approaching these ideas of ecosystems, let me take a different strand and move to Leanne, because you spoke about these transforming, industry transforming um, uh, initiatives. And one of the things that is transforming industries is blockchain and the possibility of using the technologically supported opportunities to rethink how we put different things together, not only for the benefit of the customer, but also redesigning what each part of the value chain is doing. Since that's your business, and since that's how you're thinking about adding value, could you walk us through how blockchain is helping transform the platforms and ecosystems uh, that exist? Well, it's certainly a, a brave new world to be able to consider um what a platform and what a world could look like if it was truly decentralised. And beyond that, into the, the foray of today, distributed. So decentralisation, of course, is a business model that's a true extension in time from centralised models. But now if we think about it being truly distributed, we completely flatten and collapse the value chain. The ability in the diamond industry, we began working about three and a half years ago and thought we could build the connective tissue of the industry to enable transparency. What if the consumer was able to understand where the diamond came from and could see that transparently? Would the consumer make a different decision? And in the whole consciousness of the mind, um, would it transact with a brand differently? And wind forward to today, we, uh, we're a very small company in comparison to those that are here, but. Um, we have about 2.4 million diamonds on the blockchain um, and we're in the hands of the consumer. I just came from Hong Kong where Chow Tai Fook, the largest retailer in the space, about 2,500 retail <coughs> outlets, uh, now have Everledger in the palm of their hand where consumers are making a conscious choice around the items that they're purchasing. The first step in the creation of the platform, however, has really been an extension of taking centralised giants that hold supply chain control and enabling those with technologies and somewhat we're in maybe a decentralised space. But the next stage is true um, distributed nature where a consumer can effectively choose from a directive source where a manufacturer might be able to leap across some of its um, current existing supply chain participants and go direct into the hands of the consumer itself. So the supply chain is changing dramatically. The technology now as we stand is about four years to five years in somewhat of an embryonic maturity. So it's still one of those terrible twos. It's running around, it's a little bit clumsy in terms of scalable technology, but it's starting to form its own personality. And we're starting to see use cases well beyond uh, cryptocurrency. We're starting to see this technology now in the hands of industries that are formidable industries that have been in the space for some time. Um, I'm looking forward to the day where we will have technology that is truly empowered where it can enable true peer-to-peer -peer transactions without the centralised control or mandate of large giants within supply chains. So if I hear you right, in addition to the strategic transformation that Andrew has already introduced us to, you're saying that the technological changes are not only allowing you to reorganize the supply chain, but could lead to a slightly more democratic future, which is interesting. It could be an, a counterweight to the dominance of a few strong firms. Well, if anything, that makes the competitive landscape even more complicated. So, Dick, if I may go to you. Um, 
closer to healthcare and to insurance. You guys live in a world uh, where change is knocking on the door. There is a lot of excitement still in healthcare. Uh, there is some concern in terms of privacy, the use of data, and as a result of what we can do with these technological opportunities. And then you have firms that have occupied this place for a long, long time. And Kaiser Permanente has been an industry leader for a long time. Coming from an established leader, and looking at the changes that are happening in the competitive environment towards you. How do you evaluate and how do you think about finding ways of both being more competitive and adding more value to your members? Well, change is not knocking at the door, it's coming through the door. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the light. A, lot, a lot of change in healthcare. And, and one of the things that uh, I don't think has been mentioned yet is that our consumers are looking for a certain experience. Yeah. Not, not just products and, and services, they're <laughs> looking for an experience. And what we've done in Kaiser Permanente is embraced a lot of these new technologies. So the, the platforms that are available to us, whether we're talking Google, Microsoft, Apple, we're actually embracing these platforms to really extend our ecosystem so that we can deliver a more uh, friendly experience. Uh, we're, we're very committed to our digital transformation. And, and just to give you an idea, we have about 12.8 12 million members of Kaiser Permanente. And last year we had probably, well this year we'll have about 300 million logins to Kaiser Permanente's mobile app as well as our web presence. And we find that uh, people are coming to our digital properties because that's the way people work. As a matter of fact, I believe that they're, the experience that people expect from us is largely shaped from their experience in banking or their experience in other industries. They expect the same kind of experience from their healthcare provider. So the, probably the top, the top um, functions that people come to us are on is they want to email their doctor securely. So if they have something that's happening and they want to consult with their physician, they can just send a secure email. And we probably had 25 million of secure emails last year. Uh, they want to look at their test results. So if you go in for a lab test in the morning, uh, people expect that they can go online and see their lab results. And not just see the lab results, but have an interpretation of you know, where do they stand. Uh, we refill prescriptions online. So if you have a need of prescription refill, you can go online, you can pick the prescription, make your copay, and we mail the prescription to your home. And we, we mailed probably 21 million prescriptions last year. Or people want to make appointments. You know, sometimes it's at night, and I'm thinking about, ah, I need to make a doctor's appointment. So rather than wait, they just go online, and we have the doctor's schedule available, and you can book yourself in for appointments. So these kinds of digital transactions uh, are really sort of expected. And we're continuing to look at what else can we digitize. And in order to provide these experiences, we're leveraging capabilities from Apple. We're leveraging capabilities from Microsoft. We're leveraging, uh, even, we're even talking with Amazon. You mentioned, uh, Amazon, Berkshire, Hathaway, and Chase, we're talking with, um, with them about, is there a partnership opportunity? And, you know, obviously Amazon is great at logistics, and we have a ton of logistics in healthcare, including um, delivery of prescriptions. So there may be some opportunities to partner. So we're absolutely leveraging all these capabilities to provide the type of experience that many of our members are looking for. Uh, well, one of the challenges that I see, though, is that as the opportunity emerges, these are things that a traditional and established firm, like 
Atlantic can do. But the challenge is that the same desire to create a new value proposition, often filling a void that did not exist, can come from disruptors. And you have new firms outside the industry in you know, Babylon to give an upstart in the UK that tries to coordinate all the healthcare providers and make things easier as they break traditional boundaries. So I'd like to turn to Stephen before we return back to Andrew. Uh, and Stephen, let me just ask you, uh, one of the biggest challenges in banking is precisely that, especially after the financial crisis, that has left, oh, perhaps a slightly bitter taste to customers in terms of uh, the sector overall, um, that the opportunities to do these new sorts of financial intermediation don't only exist to the traditional players, but a number of the new upstarts. So you guys are being challenged by a number of participants that would never be your competitors now, but now they are. How do you think about this competition with different types of players that also want to draw on these similar uh, opportunities that are now technologically available and much more networked linked to other sectors. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. And I think there are many, many fintechs coming there. Coming there. You know, I think the point is now what customer really demanding and what customer needs. And uh, the good point is about why, why blockchain at all? Why is this coming to a decentralized model? It's not that you need a central clearing system anymore or they expect this, especially you want to have more transparency when you come, come to cross-border payments and so on, so that you exactly want to know how much are the fees and so on. And today you still have struggled with you know, all of that, when it will arrive, when I can send it, how, how will it arrive, what I have to pay and so on. So, um, you know, we, we are doing some progress there. Um, are we fast enough compared to fintechs? And I think this is now exactly the, the, the platform approach what is going there forward because let's say like this, um, I think there are two major things what are still um, the primary challenge. So one is the technology challenge, let me say it like this. Blockchain is still not standardized. There are too many different technologies. And you know, even if like, you know, we have done recently now connecting Philippines with Hong Kong, Alipay and Gcash so that I can make really wallet to wallet transfer with my family and so on. But it's really still peer to peer. Yeah? So it's not that I can make it really across 60 countries with one, one step where also fintech companies are struggling. So to make one, one step, this is really the, the highlight to make it broader across countries, that will be the challenge. And um, I think our strategy coming to this when we are thinking about a platform approach in a sense, because still technologies are emerging so fast. So one of the key challenges with our board was like to, to explain them, there is no target architecture. Yes, we have to invest. And we can't say in three years, this is the target architecture, what we have to achieve as a platform. It's more in the sense of to be agile, to say, these are our core capabilities, what we have to establish to be ready for the three years target architecture, because this target architecture is changing. And that's coming to the platform. We are saying, OK, good news is we have a banking license. Um, the, the reality is, and this is coming to this, a platform is to collaborate with companies who don't have a banking license, but they exactly want to monetize. They want to bring their data inside. So this is exactly where we are coming inside. Yes, we have in the 60 countries the banking license, but here, by the way, can you use that? Can you bring this inside? And, you know, GP Morgan Chase has done this also as well with, you know, um, big, uh, big tech companies as well. But, you know, coming back to this, as the, the situation is also the governance challenge. And I think uh, coming to that, because our customers expecting to us to, um, that we know our customers, that we make the right risks, <coughs> that we are not coming back to 10 years ago to the same uh, you know, uh, crisis, is really about how we can make a digital identity across borders, how we can make really about that we know our customer, not just in one country, that we know this across, because then even these customers are moving there, yes? And this is exactly, I think, this, the challenge between, you know, in a distributed world, um, a company as, as we, where we are B2B, B2C, B2B, across um, all these emerging countries where the demand is there, 
but still to say we collaborate with a lot of these fintech companies who are still more locally, they, they will be best locally, where we can't compete locally. But this is exactly the point how we connect, interlink them, and bring all of the things together. Terrific. So we have started shifting away from the why ecosystems and platforms and why now to the what, what are they and how can we understand them to the who because thinking about them suggests that we have a host of new participants that can start engaging and interacting and integrating with us to the strategically more interesting questions of the so what and how. So, Andrew, as we're moving to these strategically interesting questions, um, you've uh, seen organizations that are trying to say, well, what are the implications for us? And we'll then move into the how do I help them make this transition? But as you think <coughs> about these implications in terms of the so what, what are the key themes that you have seen? And are there any areas or perhaps even any sectors where you say that this is a real burning platform where you know, uh, change is opening, uh, perhaps gushing through the doors, uh, as opposed to very gently knocking? Well, <clears throat> I think that um, I would echo the theme that everything is gushing through. Um, in fact, we say it both for our own, our own organization, Deloitte, as well as for our clients. So the first thing that, and I'll use a couple of healthcare examples, some kind of, a couple of uh, Deloitte examples, but the first thing to think about in terms of how you help yourself as an organization, or et cetera, is what problem are you trying to solve? And usually we see that there's probably three or four enterprise problems we all have to solve. One is, are we giving a better experience to our clients based on our core offerings? Two, are we delivering effectively and efficiently from a cost perspective? Three, are we operating effectively and efficiently? And lastly, our culture. And by the way, ecosystems and platforms applies to all of them. So you can have, you know, if you think about digital enterprise, automation and, and automated uh, workflows is a critical component of digitizing yourself. So we at Deloitte have formed an ecosystem of partners, cognitive AI technology partners as well as RPA, and we have a whole ecosystem around that. So the, the first thing is understand what problem you're trying to solve, figure out, you know, uh, you know what the value proposition that you want to bring, what domain issue do you want to own within that? So if you're in mobility, massive use cases. What do you want to own? If you want to own the, you know, the mobility operating system, that takes on a certain ecosystem flavor, a certain set of ecosystem partners. Do you want to be a, a convener or an orchestrator or a participant? Then what are the business and revenue flows? And then, and then most importantly, how does the data flow? Because the data is the new currency, it's the new gold. Without understanding how you're going to be able to create rich insights and monetize that, your ecosystem will fail. Um, and then lastly, you, you have to um, look at business and technology uh, roadmaps in an integrated fashion because the ecosystems will evolve sometimes in weeks and months. You have to pivot off um, because new entrants come in and uh, others exit or your ecosystem partners are not delivering what they can. So you've got to constantly be thinking about your, your business and technology roadmaps. And we will turn to that, as Stephen was saying, the idea of three-year roadmaps that we can set and then we can revisit in an annual basis is out of the window, uh, which is more exciting if you're in strategy, but a, a, a much bigger headache uh, for most people trying to make capital allocation uh, decisions. Now, Leanne, let me turn to you, because what we heard from Andrew uh, is a perspective that can uh, that is... Um, quite often the one that uh, more established larger firms take, who say, look, I'm trying to understand how my competitive environment is changing. I need to absorb these changes to be reactive, to make sure that I don't give too much white space so that people that come out of the blue uh, start filling the void. You're coming out of the blue, you want to fill the void. Mm -hmm. So help us understand how, from an entrepreneur's perspective, you take some of these disruptive changes as the opportunity to find the cracks push things open, and create value. Um, thank you. Firstly, I, I thought it was a great comment that was made about what is the target operating system, and that there is none. So thank you. <laughs> if that can permeate down through the organisation, I think you'll be one of the rising disruptors in the space. Um, this conversation, to me, just it feels like it's swirling. If the, you know, we have these incredible tools at our hand, and yet the conversation feels like, let's go bigger, better, faster. It's a race to the bottom. It's a race to the bottom. 
So I think about things completely differently. What if we could, you know, everyone is talking about innovation, yet when we try and describe innovation, we look to a data scientist to the right and a, a nerd on the left and, and, and <laughs> hope in the next generation that they'll get it right. But we're not getting it right. So I think about the use of these technologies in a way to rethink supply chains and even rethink identity. So we talk about the transfer um, of monies across borders and we talk about the identity of people. We think about it from the identity of objects. How do we identify a diamond uniquely and trace that across the world? So KYO, know your object, should now be a marriage concept with KYC, know your customer. And if the two of those come together, we have the ability to know from a medical perspective that you know the uh, the pharmaceuticals are real. They're 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 not being uh, they're not being counterfeited. Um, I think as well, large supply chains that in metals and minerals are typically uh, guarded within large scale mining environments. Yet the extractions out of the earth are in countries like Angola and Colombia, where the emeralds are, are, are some of the greatest gems in in the space of time. But the reality is the extractions out of those countries cannot make it to the hands of the right consumer at the right time who's willing to pay the right price. So instead of taking these technologies and enabling yet again that tiny crack in the door, why don't we just completely turn the entire thing upside down, just lift the table up like that terrible two-year-old does in a way that we can start to rethink. Rethink product um, from a sustainable um, level. If I'm working with the Global Battery Alliance uh, with the World Economic Forum, and as a part of that is a three-pillar um, a three-pillar exercise, and one of the pillars is technology, and of course blockchain. But as I said, is what are we doing with reuse and relife and recycling? Now, how can we rethink innovation, not just from a supply chain perspective, but the physical batteries we make? Why can't we? put track and trace at the source? Why can't we bring accountability at the source, at a product level? We have all of the uh, technologies available to us today to do that. And if we can then take that construct out in a distributed way, entirely new ecosystems will be built in countries that are deserving of the financial <coughs> advantage to those ecosystems. So, there you well, go. Well, we, we, I, I guess that uh, um, out of an entrepreneur, we would expect to have the boldest vision of transforming and rethinking every, everything. So I guess that you, you're true to form in that regard, and it's uh, fascinating to see. One thing that I'd like to simply underline is that um, your comments made me think that uh, the growth of platforms and ecosystems might not be the cause, but the symptom, i.e. that there is the opportunity of rethinking stuff of redesigning stuff. Technology, not only technology, but also changes in regulation. Massive issue that perhaps we haven't been thought, thinking it as much about, allows us to reorganize things. And if we were to be God and redesign, why don't we think about a new way of putting things together, which are not the traditional vertically integrated firms, which are not just market interfaces, but are these ecosystems of interconnected players uh, that may be able to uh, get a different way of putting them uh, and adding value to the final customer. Now, that, on the other hand, also suggests that there could be issues of both power, because you may have some very strong players leading ecosystems, or you may have some very decentralized um, ecosystems, and in sectors like both healthcare and, uh, regulate and, and financial services, uh, we may want to think about what are the implications for doing so. But rather than now entering into the question of regulation, I'd like to move to the final part of our conversation, which is the how. We've spoken about some of the so what's, whether it is from the perspective of established firms, whether it is from the perspective of someone who wants to revolutionize how the industry is set. There are some practical realities as you try to address this new world, and that means that, especially for firms that are not digital natives and that have a history and that want to be responsive, but at the same time they want to change, there's a lot of work. So, Dick, uh, you run the uh, IT for uh, a huge uh, company that needs to be responsive. 
if you think about the change management agenda, and if you think about the issues that you have in the organization as you try to be responsive, what are the main challenges that you see in your own organization? Um, <clears throat> So I want to answer that question, but I just want to make one quick comment about something Andrew said. He talked about this data is the new currency. Um, and it's, I want to talk about it in the context of your question. One of the big challenges is security. Oh, yeah. And data security, especially with these hybrid clouds where you're taking advantage of different platforms, the data security, both in financial services and in healthcare, has to be there. And sometimes it's an afterthought. It's not, you know, built in up front. So the, the security is a challenge. Um, now, uh, another challenge. You're right. Uh, Kaiser Permanente has been around for like 75 years. And, you know, it was basically brick and mortar. It was a lot of hot. And now we're incorporating all these digital technologies and we're we're, we're not saying we're making a wholesale switch, it's complementary. So as an example, uh, we did something we call reimagining ambulatory design. And what we did is we complemented the facility with new technology. We reimagined the facility layout. We took some learnings from the Apple Store and some other places to incorporate into making it more vibrant. Uh, we have some uh, technologies that we incorporated so that you can check in from home for your appointment, make your copay before you leave home. So, and then you can get a QR code much like a boarding pass. So when you come in, you can just put your QR code underneath the scanner and we know that you're there. The next step is geofencing so that we know when you arrive. So we're, we're incorporating some of these new technologies with you know, our traditional model of hospitals and brick and mortar. Another good example is in our, in our new hospitals. In, in the hospital room, we have a screen up on the wall. And from that screen, you can see what your schedule is for the day. You can order food because we have a chef in the hospital. And you can't order anything that's bad for you, of course. Uh, you, you can um, watch television when the doctor comes in. If they need a video conference with a specialist, you can video conference. So we're providing all those technical capabilities uh, inside the hospital room so it's a merging of you know, the old and the new, if you will. And we're leveraging those capabilities, much like what you see at Disney World. When you go to Disney World, it's a similar situation. Mm -hmm. uh, let me move from the agenda that you have in terms of identifying the specific items that you have to change to the way that you need to change your organization. So Stephen, if I may shift from your role, and I know that you're uh, the chief technology strategist, but there is an organizational counterpart to not only your team and choosing the right technology, but also transforming the organization, because quite often, a number of these changes means that you can't take the clients for granted. You know, you cannot say that these are the people that will be backing. No, they won't. You know, they may want to cover their needs, but they're much more broad. So as you think about the growing pains uh, of organizations that need to discipline the body politic, change the mental frames, reorganize the way that you put your budgets and uh, you put your priorities, rethink your KPIs. What are the kinds of organizational requirements to turn all these wonderful things that we have heard so far into a concrete reality? I think it's a great uh, example, and just to connect this with the how and the change. I think if you know banking very well, then you know our biggest organization is compliance. Compliance and then risk. And uh, there is lots of things to do with change, yes. And uh, um, to start with this point about data security, because at the beginning when I explained, you know, history was more like, you know, I have physical presence, branch and all of that. Then today I have, uh, you know, the mobile device as my digital presence. And, you know, even with this mobile device, 
The good news is when I talk about APIs, when I talk about ecosystem, then I still have full control. I know my objects, I know my device, I, my, I know my customers. So I have still, from a compliance risk perspective, full control on that. If I'm going now in an open ecosystem where I'm disappearing with this physical or digital presence, then I'm getting in the sense of, okay, who is using actually my APIs? Who is now augmenting my data and creating a new offering, and who has to rely on that? And now from a compliance perspective, this is a disaster. Yeah, so because now, how can I manage now the risk? How can I manage that uh, who is really now responsible for the new service and so on? Yeah, so you get, create a new, new chain of all of that. So um, this is a challenge. But now coming to the uh, thing, you know, we can't avoid it and we have to do this. So, and the point is now how we have to uh, change now, how we have to think about compliance, how we have to think about uh, risk, because this will be a different world in the ecosystem. This will be a different uh, world with the open banking. And, you know, how we are starting in that, one point what you make is really about, okay, it's also culture. And uh, uh, we, we are acting very different in Middle East compared to Africa or compared to China. China, I will say, this is the most innovative area where we are acting there. We, we launched this year in Hong Kong um, a challenger bank. So this is a complete new entity, fully digital, fully opened, with a different uh, uh, metrics there where you can say now the majority of this organization are software developers. What is a very different, uh, you know, um, go to market and building organizations instead of where we are today with our organization. So it will be definitely also organizational changes. But, you know, the, the truth in the, is in the middle because we still have to protect our customers. We still have to go in this way that we are saying, okay, we are not doing everything because maybe we are ending up in 2008. Um, and this is exactly now the balance between trying new complete, complete things where compliance has to step back, risk has to think different. And this is now exactly the way how we have to go forward because at the end, even in a distributed world, what it's still, at least from bank perspective, is our code of conduct. So code of conduct should be across all cultures, um, and this should be still be the values where we are behind. Okay, so apologies, Leanne, I'm basically going to draw on your industry and say that you're thinking that some of the things that may be your pain points could also be your gems, and you want to polish them up and sort of put them in a, a new perspective and combine them, perhaps, with new possibilities. Um, uh, to wrap up this part of the conversation, um, Andrew, running innovation for one of the big four, you have already, for a number of years, seen the challenges that organizations face in trying to change and adapt. Right now, what we are seeing with platforms of, uh, and ecosystems, whether they are the drivers, the symptoms, or both, is that there is perhaps some delta to the change agenda. So what do you think is different this time around when you see the organizations that are challenging, grappling to adjust in the requirements that this world has, which in addition to everything else, needs to be more customer focused, more digitally interconnected, and perhaps by necessity, much more interactive with designing the ecosystems being an extra new twist. What do you think are the implementation problems that you identify in the organizations that you work with? You know, the interesting thing is five, six years ago when I took on this role, the you had to convince people that this was important to do. Now that's not even an issue. The issue now is how do I do it right? And I would say there's four or five, and a couple of comments have already been mentioned, but it, it starts first with culture. Uh, most legacy companies, not digital native companies, have cultures that are contradictory to how ecosystems and platforms work and how digital companies work. So first, for example, experimentation fast failing. Uh, a study that MIT and Deloitte just did, 63% of the responders said that organizations do not share failed experiment information with their organization. Big issue. Uh, another uh, study that we did with Facebook on digital, digital transformation, 41% said 
that the adoption of digital was a real issue culturally in the organization, it wasn't supported, didn't have the incentives, et cetera. Uh, 61, uh, 78% are not delegating decision making right down to the place where you can actually make a difference. When you look at ecosystems, particularly in the, in the more, most transformative <laughs> domains, Leanne has talked about, et cetera, mobility, you know, where we're converging industries and sectors, you're, you're in nascent spaces that require significant experimentation, failing, pivoting, et cetera. I sit on the board of Deloitte, I sit on the investment committee, and we see these seven-year ROI plans come in. And you know they don't make any sense. We know that these are on the nascent bold, bold ecosystem plays. We know that a year from now, management's gonna come back and say everything's changed. You, it's just the mindset of doing ROI models has gotta change. So I think those are some of the flavors of what, what, is, what are some of the challenges. Terrific. Well, this panel uh, was set up with a very ambitious agenda of trying to think about platform and ecosystems moving from the why or why now to the what, to the who, to the so what, to the how. Um, and uh, I, we've covered a lot of ground and hopefully you've taken um, quite a bit of it. Uh, we've also promised to leave time for Q&A. In my experience, most panels don't. I'm delighted to see that we're able to leave uh, more than 15 minutes for the uh, Q&A session. So let me open it up to the floor and then we'll uh, wrap it up in order to wrap it up on time. So uh, may I see show of hands and probably a microphone needs to go around to get the translation. And first, first the gentleman uh, there, then the lady on the left. Hello, my name is Kumar, KS Kumar. I had a question, uh, of course, this, this whole discussion that we were listening to was about the digital connected technologies you know, making difference to the way a normal business is done. You're talking about how the brick and mortar business is uh, being enabled in the healthcare using technology. What I was looking for is what exactly is the future looking like in terms of a platform strategy? Uh, between a single platform to the connected platforms of different kinds, and how does it transform business entirely? Is there a vision around it, sector by sector, or is it generally, you know, as we go along, we digitize something and something else, and you know, it does not really come into a platform strategy. So I do not get a sense of what exactly are we talking about here in terms of platform strategy, mm -hmm. single platform to the mm -hmm. macro macro platform or, or the ecosystem itself that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone wants to, uh, to, to take that? Well, maybe I can start. Um, I, I think it's a great question because uh, I think Michael mentioned earlier, you, you're seeing the formation of formidable giant ecosystems. They're already here. So I had mentioned <laughs> Microsoft and Walmart getting together. This is a direct competitive response to Amazon's dominance in the marketplace. So you're seeing a, a bricks and mortar company with a lot of, you know, traditional value propositions, distribution channel, customer base, a lot of investment in, in AI and data science, now combining with Microsoft saying, let's put our, so I think what you're gonna see is existing incumbents jump into ecosystems, either the ones that already exist, like what does the target do in the future? I think it's gonna have to pick an ecosystem. So I think in some spaces like retail, the next frontier will be the consolidation of ecosystems. I don't think you could survive without it. Yeah, Leanne. I, I also think that um, it's not settled yet. We're in this period where a lot of transformation is still taking place. So much like uh, Microsoft and Walmart, we're looking at uh, what types of care can be provided digitally and how might that affect our capital plans in terms of, are there new hospitals we won't need to build? Because we were taking so much out that we're doing digitally that we can actually not build as many uh, clinics and hospitals because there are certain types of care that we're able to provide uh, digitally, either through email, through telephone calls, through video, where we can actually video with someone using their smartphone and we can see the, the wound, if you will, or see what is going on and handle that remotely. So we're looking at uh, how much can we do virtually 
and see if that will affect our capital plans. Dan. So I think the, the, new, the platform of the future is about me, the data of me. I have <laughs> my data, I control my data, I permission when you have the right to see it, for how long. I have the layer upon which I decide to share the fidelity of that data through cryptography. So that's what we'll see. We won't be, uh, and, the pl and the platform that, and a set of technologies that can enable that to happen um, securely, either through chips or through, um, through a, soft, uh, a soft layer of security with cryptography is the platform that will um, overnight yeah. exempt what's happening in the space. Well, if I may, as someone who doesn't only work with organizations but researchers, platforms and ecosystems, let me just say that this is a time of ferment, ferment even in the uh, business school academic community that is working in them. A couple of very quick thoughts. First thing, this platform strategy at the level of the project and the level of the firm. You should never speak about Microsoft platform or a Facebook platform or Google platform. They've got about 30 or 40 different platforms that sit underneath each of them with its own SBU style level project on what do we do in this particular sub-market and with some connection between them in terms of my desire to be in particular areas. So we are revisiting the corporate strategy level at the platform level, i.e. that we do things at the business level and then we see how they connect. Uh, the second thing is that some of the truisms of the early platform literature is being brushed aside. Network externalities, size is all not true. Uh, think about the failure of Uber in terms of entering a number of uh, the markets where smaller competitors uh, grab um, or Kojak in Indonesia uh, in terms of mobility and the way that they've grown uh, have been able to work. And then finally, what uh, let me just sort of leverage what Leanne was saying that we have changing attitudes in terms of regulators and customers of what they're going to be tolerating in terms of the platforms. And part of the blockchain revolution may be part of the pushback against dominance. At the same time, you have some firms, both in the United States and in China, that have very strong concentration. What do I expect? The Europeans to fight back. And the fact that there aren't very strong platform companies in Europe is helping the intellectual development of the case for a new type of power that my colleagues in economics don't understand, which is the power of the orchestrator. We're only starting to uh, address this and the issues of power concentration in the economy, and uh, it'll take a bit of convincing in the Department of Justice, and uh, I don't even know, because I don't know the regulatory infrastructure here, but watch this space. A lot will be happening. Yes, the lady here. Good morning, I'm Julia Zanzi, I'm a Global Shaper. And um, we heard about uh, the future of platform and the QR codes and especially how it will evolve in healthcare and banking. And, and we also know that the aging population is growing more and more. And my question is how do we make sure that technology is actually inclusive and is not uh, excluding mature consumers that are a big portion, especially into the healthcare business as patients? Thank you. Anyone would like, yeah. Stephen, yeah, yeah, maybe to start here, and I think that's exactly the point you touched this, um, you know, it depends on the cultures. So if you go to Africa, that's very different. But if you go to Middle East and so on, you're touching exactly the point where we as a bank with 160 years uh, history, we, we still need also the, you know, human driven um, banking. So because this is still needed and then we are augmenting this with technologies to make them better. We are putting some assistance beside and so on to make this, you know, even, uh, you know, more sophisticated. But I, this is again coming to the, the cultures where in Africa the population is much, much younger compared to when you are in other countries where you have still um, an older population going there who are really need also this. And be frank, I think the truth of platform is in the middle. So that we have on one side the new field where we have to bring and to enable ourselves because this is coming. But on the other side, we have also to, to make this in a, some sense, um, you know, even still human based. And make, let me make one example where we have done in the last three years where we are quite pl uh, proud of uh, what we call it a platform. And this can be used for both models, completely digital as well as human driven. 
Um, so what we started three years ago to, to really consolidate 750 data sources across 60 market in one data lake. So this is quite unique in banking where we are really proud of. But on the other side now, the unique value proposition with this platform is, so it's centralized, not decentralized, is now with all the markets, I can now assist my humans better. I can assist, you know, that they can act better for what to understand me and so on, yes? So, but on the other side, I can also leverage this to put on our Alexa on top. I can put artificial intelligence on top. So I can also go another world with the same platform with two very different channels. Yes, so on one side, help the human base. On the other side, help the digital base. Mm -hmm. let, me, let me take some question from this side of the room in order not to be too biased. Gentleman there. Hey, uh, thanks for the uh, interesting discussion. Johannes Metzer from Edge Technologies. Um, we're in the middle of our own digital transformation, thinking a lot about you know, ecosystems and platforms in the space of uh, smart buildings and the future of buildings. I, I was resonating very strongly with one of the last comments that you made about culture in the organization, that this is most important for the how. Um, and, and I was going to ask, you know, what have you seen in your organization specifically as the things that work best in order to facilitate that cultural organizational transformation of the whole workforce towards mindsets like failure, experimentation, adoption of digital tools and, and processes. Oh dear, and we don't have a full day to, to discuss <laughs> that. I'm sure that all of us would be able to spend that. Any telegraphic comments in terms of that? And just to help focus it a bit, what is different in these types of transformations? Because there's a number of things that are common with any other processes um, of change. Um, uh, Andrew? Yeah, I, can, I think the... I think really understand what is the essence of the culture that you're in. In our case, it's either my culture at Deloitte or my client's culture. And sometimes you just have to feed the beast, if I can use that term. If, if your culture is a strong operating culture and it's all about delivering quarterly results, you have to find some way to align your transformation to that. It can't, because you're never going to be able to forget that it's there. So that's a nugget that I think it's important uh, and, you know, we, we, we introduced in some of our clients and in our own organization this concept of the last mile. How can you monetize the experimentation faster? How can you get into the marketplace faster? When, you're, when the legacy companies uh, that are so financially driven, so short-term driven, when they actually can see that there's good customer feedback happening and they can see monetization around the horizon, it actually starts to move the culture. Let right, me, uh, let's one other one, Michael. Yes, I would say modeling. You know, leverage your early adopters, create a space where you can model the new workflow and bring people in and let them experience it and uh, allow the, those early adopters to influence them. Yeah. Pilots are easier in the digital space. Question there, gentlemen. Morning, my name is Carsten Otto from Germany, Kaizen Institute. I have a question special to Richard Daniels, <laughs> or uh, uh, focused on that. Uh, healthcare, yeah? We have a lot of uh, platforms in healthcare, hospitals and medical engineering and, and pharmaceutic and so on. Based on your experience, what are the strange points and the weak points to involve patients or patient association in such platforms because we all can become patients. Absolutely, I think it's incredibly important. I mentioned the work that we did on reimagining ambulatory design. We actually brought in patients and had them, we built a prototype of the, of the office and we brought in patients and have them actually go through it and go through the experience and give us feedback. It was incredibly helpful. So having patients involved, even with our digital properties, we engage patients to look at their use of the platforms and their use of our mobile app, and we get lots of great feedback. So I would say that's incredibly important. Right, um, let me get one question from this table. Hi, good morning everybody. It's uh, Nilesh Jain from Clinic Vantage. Uh, I had a question regarding the healthcare digital platforms they're talking about and 
there was a point made about digital currency or data as currency. I think healthcare is gonna be very sensitive in how we leverage data. When we talk about platforms like the WEF and we look at LMIC countries, right? How do we bring the influence of digital platforms that are happening in the healthcare space, taking them into the LMIC countries? What are your thoughts about that, number one? And the second is, how do we integrate these platforms where data can be leveraged for the greater good? And I think the challenge in healthcare today is a lot of the data is operated in silos just because a lot of privacy, security, and other concerns. How do we expedite that? Yeah. I think that's going to help us in developing a lot more technologies that can help um, from a healthcare perspective. Dick, I'd focus probably on the second because the first one is going to be a little more technical for the limited time we have. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> we're working with companies like Apple, and one of the things that we're, we're focusing on is giving the ability for people to download their health information to, let's say, their phone. Or, you know, we're talking with Google about doing the same thing for Android. So this way, uh, people can have healthcare data with them, and to your point, it's their data. And now they have information, and wherever they want to go for care, they'll have their data. Uh, and let me take probably a final uh, question, lady here in the stable. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Annie Cole, Singapore Management University. I'm just curious, have any of you worked with governments as platforms? That means you have clients but for governments, it's the citizens of the country. How do you think the government should look at itself if it's to operate as a platform? The idea of interoperability in government is something that makes me profoundly confused <laughs> in my limited engagement that I have had with government authorities. I don't know whether anyone is more optimistic than me. <laughs> we, we typically view government as providing the regulatory oversight. That's, that's typically the way we view it. Well, yeah. Go ahead. Richard. Yes, we work with them, but um, they're both customers because, you know, in from a, provide care to many government agencies and their people. So they're a customer of ours, but they also provide regulatory oversight. Yes. So I just, just a couple of uh, perspectives. One is um, we have worked with governments, and I'll, I have a specific example of the FDA in the U.S where I remember walking into a Fortune 50 pharmaceutical company's C-suite and talking about the disruption in ecosystems and platforms, and they said the regulators will never go for this. This was at the time where you had uh, uh, 23 and Me being shut down by, by the FDA because they saw it encroaching on medicine. Uh, we had a meeting with the FDA, and we actually had a big transformation project with them. It's essentially, where they agreed that they would start to rethink how they look at approving thera therapies because software now is becoming in every, embedded in everything we do. So they have committed to a transformation journey of themselves as they think about how to keep up with disruption. Yeah. The second thing, you're, you're from Singapore. We are working with the Singapore government on many different aspects on mobility, for example. Uh, we're looking at the Smart City Initiative there as well. Yeah. As an enabler of platforms. Well, perhaps uh, just, just to wrap up, it, it seems that government agencies, and I will absolutely not say governments, sort of different story, government agencies are responding probably in a more reactive than proactive manner because the world is moving right. ahead so fast that they are realizing healthcare is the prime example, right. that they're missing a trick and that they are wasting the possibility of saving resources and as such they need to adjust just to be able to keep with the times. Now, uh, moving in this direction would take us to <laughs> literally a whole day. If I see the number of hands that have gone up, uh, we would be staying here for a long, long time. Uh, unfortunately, we are bound certainly to end on time, uh, and I'd like to uh, honor this particular commitment, but also to say that this is part of a conversation. As I was uh, mentioning, and you know, Derek and Christian are um, helping coordinate an effort in the understanding of digital platforms and ecosystems. Um, Deloitte and others are involved in an effort of having the forum leverage 
the knowledge and uh, interest of the communities. So please continue being in touch. I'm sure that this is a conversation that we will continue in a number of um, other occasions. And what I found really exciting about this conversation is that we're not just speaking about it as if it's new. It's a much more grown up and we are starting to move into the real issues uh, from the organization moving all the way to the government. So please join me in thanking this panel for a wonderful morning together. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. All right, very good.